Hey guys, Brian Schultz here with Cape Falcon Kayak. And in this video, I'm gonna show you the edge tools that we use in skin on frame boat building and how to get them sharp. Now, before we get into this, I just wanna warn you in advance, this is gonna be a long video and it also might be kind of boring. But if there's any aspect of woodworking that's worth putting your time into, it's learning how to sharpen correctly. If you take the time to set yourself up right from the beginning, your tools are gonna to be a lot quicker and easier to sharpen and you're gonna do much better work with those tools. So in this video, we're gonna focus primarily on low angle block planes, but the sharpening techniques that we use here can be applied to other types of planes and chisels. I'm gonna start out by showing you some of the different block plane options that are available and what I like and what I don't like about each one of them. And then I'm gonna give you a tour of a really inexpensive sharpening setup that will give you great results followed by a tour of my own sharpening setup, which costs a little bit more money, but makes the process even faster and easier. After that, I'm gonna show you how to disassemble a brand new block plane and get it ready for use. And then finally, we're gonna put a razor sharp edge on that plane iron, and we're gonna check out the results. So stick around, I promise it will be worth your time. So starting out with the tools themselves, I don't actually use that many edge tools in my skin on frame boat building. Just a low angle block plane, a couple chisels, and that's pretty much it. Now, of course, if you wanted to, you could get a lot more edge tools involved than that. But when you're talking about doing things quickly and efficiently, it's probably gonna be a lot easier and a lot less expensive just to pick up a handheld power planer, for example, than it is to buy a really hefty jack plane and take the time to set this up properly. So if you're someone who loves working with hand tools, there are other options. And the same sharpening system I'm gonna show you here today is going to apply to any type of a plain iron or chisel. So like I said earlier, most of this video is gonna focus on block planes, but just taking a quick look at my own chisels for a moment, this one over here is just a really cheap Stanley three quarter inch chisel. This is a low quality chisel with really soft steel, which means that it's easy to sharpen, but it doesn't hold an edge very well. But for how much I actually use it, this is fine for what I do. Now, the chisel that I end up using more often is this older Marples chisel. And once upon a time, these were actually a really good mid-grade comfortable chisel but unfortunately over the years, the steel in these has gotten a lot softer in the newer models. And for reasons that I can't even begin to imagine, they just changed the handle shape so it's square in the back, so it's actually uncomfortable to use. And so this has been my go-to recommendation for 20 years. I can't recommend these particular chisels anymore. And I'm actually looking for an alternative recommendation for a good medium quality comfortable chisel. I just found a great video on YouTube from a gentleman who did a scientific test on over 42 different chisels and generated this enormous spreadsheet with all these different variables. So if you wanna learn more about woodworking chisels than you could have ever imagined, I'll make sure I put a link to that video in the description below. But just as a general rule of thumb, for the average woodworker, what you're looking for is a medium hardness chisel with a comfortable handle. And the reason you want this to be medium hardness is because if you get a really hard chisel, yes, it will hold its edge a lot longer, but it's gonna be way harder to sharpen and it's gonna be more likely to chip on the blade. And it is a lot harder to fix a chipped chisel than it is to sharpen a little bit more often. And then on the other end, obviously you don't want a really soft chisel because then like this one, you're gonna to have to be constantly resharpening. So once I actually have a new chisel recommendation, I'll make sure to put that in our Amazon list. Now, on the other hand, when we come over here to the block planes, I do have some pretty strong opinions and preferences. So starting on the left here, my absolute favorite block plane is just an old Stanley 60 and a half with a carbon steel blade. If I could have any block plane in the world at any price, I would still choose this as my personal block plane. Now, another great old plane is this old record 60 and a half. It's a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier, but it still works great. And neither of these have been produced for decades, but you can find them at garage sales, flea markets, antique stores. Sometimes you can find them on eBay, but the prices are pretty inflated these days. And for many years, this is all that I recommended to people because all of the other new low angle block planes had some problem that I just couldn't live with. However, 
Just recently, this last year, Jorgensen came out with their own low angle block plane, and I think this is one of the best block planes that you can buy today. It's pretty much identical to the 60 and a half in its hand geometry. It's a little bit heavier, which I don't necessarily love, but it does have a thicker plane iron, and also the plane iron is made out of O1 steel, which is a little bit harder to sharpen than plain carbon steel, but not so hard that you have to move up to a diamond-based sharpening system. Now, before we go any further, I just wanna take a moment here and go on a little rant about block planes, because I know there's woodworkers out there that are wondering right now, what about the new Stanley Sweethearts? What about the Wood River? What about the Veritas planes? What about the Lie Nielsen? And yes, all of those planes are significantly more expensive and they do have a higher build quality, but I'm not convinced they're actually any better for the job. So starting out with the Wood Rivers and the Stanleys, I can't tell you exactly what's wrong with those because they're beautiful planes. They should work well, but I have just never had luck getting those planes to cut nicely. I used to sharpen all my students' block planes before we would carve Greenland paddles in my classes, and both of those planes would never give me the cut that I wanted. Now, when we get into the Veritas planes, I really can't say anything definitively negative about them. Um, they run really well. The sole seems to be nice and flat on those, and you've got a choice of different steels, including PMV11, which is absolutely the best quality plain iron material out there. So the Veritas is actually a good choice. It's just expensive and I don't like how it looks. Now, getting into the Lie Nielsen planes, those are the really beautiful blades. They're gold and they're cast out of bronze and brass. And the actual plane body itself is perfect. It's machined to precision tolerances. Everything's great. My problem with Lie Nielsen tools is that they use an A2 tool steel blade. And A2 tool steel is significantly harder than any of those other steels that I've just mentioned. And the idea behind A2 tool steel is that it's a little bit harder to sharpen, but it's gonna hold its edge a lot longer and it's gonna give you a much sharper edge. That's what the metallurgy says. However, in actual practice, both myself and other woodworkers, it seems like it's about twice as hard to sharpen. It doesn't stay sharp that much longer and it doesn't really give you a better edge. And so A2 tool steel blades usually just end up kind of sitting off to the side and you're more likely to grab your regular carbon steel tools because it's a lot quicker to throw a nice sharp edge on it and keep working. So those are my feelings about block planes. Feel free to have your own preferences. And if you really want to geek out on the subject of blade steel, there is a great blog on the Axminster Tools website, and I'll make sure I throw a link to that in the video description. All right, so before we get into flattening and sharpening, I just want to walk you through the setup here really quick. Now, keep in mind, there are lots of other sharpening systems out there. I just choose this particular setup because I think it is the easiest and the least expensive way that you can get a good sharp edge on your tools. So. Starting out with the foundation of the system, we've got a piece of 3 8 inch thick plate glass that is one foot square and it's broken on all the edges just so you don't cut yourself. Now off to the side here, you can see I've got a stack of sandpaper and this is silicon carbide waterproof sandpaper from 80 grit all the way up to 400 grit. So I've got a sheet of 80, I've got a sheet of 120, I've got a sheet of 180, I've got a sheet of 220, a sheet of 320, and a sheet of 400. And then at the very bottom here, I also have some 100 grit sanding screen, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So this sandpaper is gonna get completely used up. We're gonna use this to flatten the bottom of the plane. And the basic rule here is you're gonna work each of these pieces of sandpaper until the sandpaper is pretty much toast, and then you could probably go on to the next grit. And unless your block plane is really badly out of flat, that should be sufficient for you. Now, once we get done flattening the sole of the block plane, next we're gonna get into sharpening the blade of the block plane or the chisel. And to do that, we're gonna be using this really inexpensive double-sided King Waterstone. This is 1,000 on one side, it's 6,000 on the other, and if you can only have two grits, those are the ones you want because the 1,000 side is gonna do more of a cutting work and the 6,000 side is gonna give you just enough of a polish if you wanna cut through dense hardwood. Now, 
You can spend a lot more money on water stones than this, and generally the advantage is sometimes they're a little bit harder, so you don't have to reflatten them quite as much, and also they have a broader surface area, which is definitely a little bit nicer to sharpen on. But I tend to recommend the least expensive option first, because oftentimes people are just building one or two boats, and there's no reason to get set up with a big, elaborate, expensive sharpening system. Also, this particular stone comes with its own holder. It's not the best holder, but it definitely works. And then to go with this stone, I've also got this really inexpensive honing guide. And the way this works is you could slide a plain iron or a chisel into this clamp right here. And then I've got a couple little blocks that I've made on my chop saw. One's at 30 degrees and one's at 25 degrees. And I just use these for setting the angle of the blade before I tighten down the clamp. And then after that, we can spray some water on this surface. And all you got to do is just work this thing back and forth to sharpen this edge, and that's going to make sure that the angle stays consistent. Now, anytime you're working with water stones, you're also going to need some means of flattening them because as you're working chisels and planes on them, they're going to start to dish out a little bit. And if you don't deal with that right away, it's going to start to change the shape of your blade. And it is a lot harder to reprofile a blade than it is to reflatten a stone. So easy thing to do here is just get a piece of 100 grit sanding screen and you can put it on the glass surface. And when the stone is dry, you can go ahead and just rub it across this screen. And if you do this every time you sharpen, it's only gonna take a couple strokes to get this flat, and then you're not gonna to have to do all the work with a diamond stone of reprofiling your blades later. Just make sure that it's dry, because if you do this wet, this little grit can sometimes embed itself into the surface of the stone, and that's not a good idea. So scrub it while it's dry, wipe it off a little bit, and then right before you sharpen, you end up wetting these stones down so they're lubricated. Now, before we move on here, I also want to mention diamond stones. And so what we're looking at here is a piece of aluminum. It could also be steel. And the surface of this is impregnated with diamond grit. And the advantage to diamond stones is they're super sharp and they're really abrasive, so they can cut through metal really fast. You're not going to need it immediately, but if you get into woodworking, sooner or later you're going to drop your chisel or your plane and you're going to damage the edge, and you're going to need a really abrasive stone to be able to reprofile that surface. And the ideal stone is going to be a coarse grit, which is going to be around 220, and then a medium grit, which is going to be around 400, and then you can switch back over to your regular water stones. Personally, I just have this 400 grit, so when I need to reprofile, I'd have to work it a little bit longer, but it works just fine for me. Now, something to note here is that even though these are sold often as lapping plates, I don't usually like to use them for lapping the bottom of a plain sole initially, because even though this diamond is going to cut a lot faster than the sandpaper I'm about to show you, this soft metal tends to gum up the diamond surface and it's hard to clean out. And also, the soft metal can tend to yank little bits of diamond out of the stone and also working a block plane as much as you're about to watch in the next step on top of a diamond stone is going to take a lot of the life out of your expensive diamond stone. So this is great for reprofiling edges, not good for lapping planes. So that's the basic sharpening setup, and this is all you really need to get the job done. But if you think you're going to get into woodworking a little more seriously, there's a couple more things we can add here that are going to make your sharpening a lot easier and a lot more efficient. So let's just come over to my own personal sharpening station here really quick. And starting at the bottom, the foundation of this sharpening station is just an old cabinet that I picked up off the side of the road. I liked it because it was nice and heavy and it was free. And this cabinet is leveled, so it's angled just slightly forward. That way, if I'm spraying water in my tray here, it's going to run to the front of the tray and just not make a big soupy mess. And then also, I've custom fitted a couple blocks between this cabinet and the wall. That way, when I'm really pushing on this, when I'm sharpening, it doesn't wobble back and forth. It's nice and solid, and that's important. And then also, you can see on the back side of my sharpening trade here, I've also got another block in between it and the wall, once again. So when I'm sharpening, this doesn't move back and forth. Basically, you want this whole thing to be set up at the most comfortable height you can. For me personally, that's about 36 inches. I'm about five foot eight inches tall. If you're too high over this, what's gonna happen is you're gonna have a tendency to kind of trip forward and kind of damage your blade and possibly damage your stone. And if you're too low, you're not gonna be able to get good pressure on this, so you're not gonna sharpen very efficiently. 
So coming in a little bit closer, you can see below the table, I've got a shelf with all my different edge tools. Over on this side, I've got my lapping plate. I've got this uh, non-slip pad, which came with my lapping plate, which is really helpful. And then I've got all my different grits of sandpaper and also my sanding screen. And then if we come up here to the sharpening tray, this is really just a baking sheet. And in that baking sheet, off to the right-hand side, I've got this cheap diamond stone that I use for reprofiling damaged edges. And then these three stones are the Shapton ceramic stones. And the nice thing about the Shapton stones is even though they're water stones, they don't need to be soaked. You can just go ahead and splash them really quick. And they're a little bit harder than some of the softer stones that have to be soaked. So they're going to last a little bit longer. This one is a 1000 grit. This one is a 5000 grit. And this one is an 8000 grit. And I feel like that's a pretty good series of steps for the type of woodworking that I do. One thing I do want to mention, however, with the Shapton stones is that the thousand grit is really soft. And so if you're going to get this particular stone for your thousand grit, you're going to have to make sure that you re-flatten it every single time you sharpen. And if you don't want to do that, Shapton does make a different type of stone called a glass stone, which is literally glass embedded with ceramic abrasive particles. And the nice thing about the glass stone is that it's going to stay perfectly flat. The less nice thing is that it's not going to last as long because you're basically just working on that grit on the surface and you're not slowly wearing through to new grits like you would with this type of water stone. So really up to you how you want to manage that situation. Back here, I've got the little wedges that I use to set my blade angles. Got a dedicated screwdriver for my honing guide. I've also got my honing guide right here. And then over here, I've just got a little plastic tub where I put my water stones whenever I'm switching over to the glass lapping plate. And then finally in the back, I've just got a couple spray bottles. All right, so that's my basic sharpening setup. And if you're wondering how much this stuff costs, including the diamond stone, this is all about $150. And you don't actually need the diamond stone when you're starting out. So it's really only about $100 worth of stuff, which is really reasonable for sharpening equipment. And just a quick side note here, if you want to pick up all this stuff in one place, I've put all of it in an Amazon list, which I'll put in the video description below, and also under the resources tab on our website. We get a tiny kickback if you make a purchase on that list. It's not much, but it does help to support these videos. So anyways, let's go ahead and come back to the block plane here. And first thing we're going to do is work on flattening the sole. So if you purchase a high-end block plane, like a Veritas or a Lai Nielsen, it might come with a blade that's already sharp and a sole that is already flat. And in that case, you can just take it out of the box and start your woodworking. But with a mid-grade plane like this one, we're gonna need to sharpen this blade and we're gonna also need to flatten the sole. So why don't we start out just by taking this apart and I'll show you the different pieces and how they work. I'm gonna loosen this screw here. So I can slide off the cap. The cap is what holds the blade in place and it has this screw mechanism right here that can tighten down onto the blade so it can't move. This is a little different just depending on which plane you have. Uh, next up, we've got the plane iron. Like I said, I think this is a great plane iron. It's a little bit thicker than the one that comes with my antique planes and also it's O1 steel, which is a good compromise between hardness and sharpening ability. Now the blade itself is sitting on the bed right here. And when you open one of these up, you always want to check the bed to make sure there's no little chunks of metal that are stuck down in there and that there wasn't any problems with the casting. Because if there is, this isn't going to sit in there flat and then your blade isn't going to cut right. So if you're noticing any little bloops of metal, you can get in there with a file really quick and just make sure this is nice and flat. Also, there might be a quite a bit of machine oil in here. There is on this one. So it's not a bad idea just to Go ahead and wipe that out of there. And then this screw back here is the adjustment that engages the blade or pulls it back just to change the depth of the cut. And then at the other end of the plane, we've got this little knob, which is a convenient place to rest your finger so you've got good control of the plane. But you can also unscrew this a little bit and that's gonna let you move this lever forward and back. And what this does is it controls this plate right here and the reason you might want to move this is if you run into some challenging grain that tears out, if you tighten this down so there's just a tiny space between the edge of the blade and the throat right there, that's going to prevent that tear out 
The downside is that it's gonna be much more likely to clog with shavings. So most of the time, I've got the throat open about halfway like this, and I only close it down if I run into challenging grain. So once you've taken this apart and you're sure that all the mechanisms are working smoothly, we're gonna go ahead and put the plane back together before we flatten the bottom. Because once you tighten the cap down, that's actually gonna put a little bit of tension and it's gonna put a tiny, tiny amount of curve into this steel right here. So if you were to flatten this without the blade in place, what would happen is it would be flat when you got done with that process, but then when you put the blade in place, the bottom of the plane would curve a little bit and it wouldn't run as good as it could otherwise. So what you wanna do is put the blade in, we're gonna put the cap on, I'm gonna go ahead and tighten this up, and what we're gonna do is back the blade out with the adjuster screw until it just disappears from the throat. We don't want this to be pulled back any further than the edge of the throat, and we don't want the blade to be sticking out into the throat. You want it to be right at the edge. Just gonna tighten this screw a little bit. And then I'm gonna use the thumb wheel right here to tighten down the blade to where I can still just barely move the blade with the adjuster screw. And then I'm gonna tighten it just a little bit more to where I can't move the blade with the adjustment screw. You're gonna double check to make sure this knob up here is nice and tight. And now we're ready to flatten the sole. So I'm gonna start by grabbing a spray bottle and I'm just gonna wet down the glass. And then I'm gonna grab this sheet of 80 grit waterproof silicon carbide sandpaper. These are about a dollar a piece. I'm gonna wet down the back side of this. And I'm gonna flip it over, stick it onto the glass. And depending on the sandpaper, this might stay nice and stuck and you don't have to do anything else. Or you might have to grab a couple clamps like this and put them on the back side so it doesn't slide around on you. And you wanna wet down the front side, make it nice and wet and you're gonna grab your plane and you're gonna use a lot of pressure and you're just gonna start scrubbing this back and forth across this whole surface. And I just wanna mention that the point of this is not to make the whole bottom of the plane shiny, it's to make the whole bottom of the plane flat. And to be really precise, you don't actually have to flatten the entire bottom, you just have to flatten the perimeter and also both sides of the throat. So I'm gonna go ahead and work this a little bit. And after a couple minutes of working this, you wanna flip it over, wipe off the bottom and take a look at it. And you can see here pretty clearly that I've worked it all the way around the edge. It's nice and flat all the way around the perimeter, around the front. I don't quite have this back edge yet. I have the front edge of the throat, I don't quite have the back edge, and then there's a pretty substantial dip right here. So I'm gonna work this a little bit more until it's shiny here and shiny here, and then we can move on to the next grit. All right, so after about 20 minutes total, I'm just finishing up on a sheet of 400 grit right now. If you want to, you can go all the way to 600 grit or 1,000, but it's not really necessary. And one last thing I like to do is I like to put this at about 45 degrees and just work the edges of the plane as well because if your plane was really badly not flat, you might have had to grind this down to where these edges are gonna be kind of sharp. So I'm just doing this on all sides helps to deal with that sharp edge. Okay, so once I've done that, I can go ahead and turn this over, spray it wipe it off, and this looks pretty good. I can still see a little bit of the original scratch pattern right here, and there might be a couple of tiny scratches on the back side of the throat, which I'm not thrilled about, but I think this is good enough for now. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this aside, take off the sandpaper, wipe down my surface, and now we're gonna go ahead and take this thing apart again. And you wanna make sure you do this right away because there's gonna be a lot of water in here. And if you leave it that way, it's gonna rust. So just go ahead and take your plane apart. And I would actually recommend unscrewing the throat knob completely. You wanna take the throat plate all the way out. And then you just wanna get in here and you wanna wipe down all of these surfaces. Make sure there's no water at all. 
All right, so once that's nice and dry, next thing you're gonna do is grab some oil. This could be WD-40, Triflow, mineral oil, machine oil, doesn't really matter. And we're just gonna put a little bit all over the plane to lubricate these pieces so they run a little bit cleaner and also to impregnate into this bare metal that we just exposed to help protect it and to keep it from rusting. Okay, so next thing we're gonna do is sharpen up this plain iron. And I'm not actually gonna show you how to sharpen a chisel, but everything I'm about to show you on the plain iron is exactly the same on a chisel. So we're gonna start out here with this 1,000, 6,000 stone that I showed you earlier. This is a water stone, and it's always a good idea to soak this in water for about 15 minutes before you get started. You also wanna have a spray bottle nearby so you can keep it wet while you're working. However, before you put this in water, if you've recently used this stone, it's always a good idea to grab that piece of sanding screen I showed you earlier and just really quickly hit both sides to make sure that they're nice and flat. Otherwise, you're gonna start dishing out your stones, which is gonna start curving your edges, which is a lot more work later on. So I already know that this is flat. I've already soaked this in water for 15 minutes. And next, I'm gonna put this in a holder. This thing actually comes with its own holder, which does work pretty good, but these rubber holders that are about $15 work a lot better. So I'm gonna stick this in here and I'm gonna tighten it down. With the dark side facing up, this is the uh, 1000 side and that's where we're gonna start here. And then I'm gonna get this nice and wet, really fill it up with water. So with any brand new plain iron or chisel, the first thing we need to do is flatten the back side to get rid of all these machine scratches. Because if you just hone the bevel here, you're not actually gonna end up with a sharp edge, you're gonna end up with a microscopically serrated edge. So way to do this is we're gonna hold the backside flat against the stone. And with a lot of pressure, you wanna start working this back and forth. You don't have to do the entire back of the plain iron, just the front portion of this is fine. And just like with the flattening, this is gonna take a few minutes to get rid of those scratches. It's a good idea to kind of change the angle of it a little bit while you're working. And make sure you're holding this nice and flat and always make sure your fingers are behind it so you don't accidentally cut yourself. And while you're doing this, the surface is gonna to start to clog with slurry. So every once in a while, you wanna spray it down keep working it. And then at the end of about five minutes here, spray this off. And it looks like I've got good shiny metal and I don't see any of the original scratches for at least the first half inch from the edge back to about here. If you wanna go further than that, that's great. You can get as OCD as you want to, but this is all that's really necessary. So next I'm gonna go ahead and flip this stone over to the 6,000 side. Once again, get it nice and wet. And then we're gonna do the same thing on this side. And you can see how quickly that's changing color. All that gray is metal coming off the surface of this. And this tends to clog up even faster, so. This is why I have a towel down on my workbench because otherwise this would make a pretty big mess. And while I'm doing this, I just wanna mention that if you wanna get a little more serious about sharpening, it's actually better to have a 1,000, a 3,000, and a 6,000 stone because the jump between 1,000 and 6,000 is pretty big and oftentimes you have to work this pretty hard to get the 1,000 scratches out. So go ahead and finish this up here. Go ahead and turn it over. Spray it down, carefully wipe this off. And what we wanna see here is none of the original machine scratches and none of the scratches from the thousand grit side, at least for the first quarter inch back from the edge. So this should be a nice mirror polish all along the back side of this edge. And if that's true, now we can go on to the other side. All right, so starting out with this cheap honing guide that I showed you guys earlier, Next thing we're gonna do is grab your chisel or your plain iron, we're gonna clamp it into this, and then we're gonna set the angle. So if you have a plain iron that is wider than one and three eighths of an inch, oftentimes you can put that on this top shelf right here and clamp it down, and that actually is a lot more stable. 
But unfortunately, for these 1 and 3 eighths wide plane irons, usually you have to slide it into the chisel slot, which is right down here. And not everybody understands how this works, so I wanted to show you guys this. So I'm going to sl slide this in here. Make sure it's uh, locked down. And you want to tighten the adjustment screw to where you can just barely move this back and forth. Now, next thing we're going to do is grab these little angle blocks that I showed you earlier. This is just little chunks of hardwood that I nibbled off with my chop saw. This one's 25 degrees and this one is 30 degrees. Now, if you're re-beveling a damaged chisel or plain iron, let's say you damaged it and you're going to be working it on a diamond stone, in that case you're going to want to re-grind it to 25 degrees. But if you're just honing the edge like we're doing today, we're going to be using the 30 degree angle instead. So the main grind on the back side of this is 25 degrees, but the hone angle is 30 degrees. And the way I'm going to set this up is I'm going to grab a little chunk of double-sided tape and I'm going to stick it down. And then I'm going to stick this block on top of it. And then coming in really close on this, I'm going to set the honing guide and the blade over top of the block. I like to put a couple fingers right here. And then you can just really carefully roll the wheel forward while you're pushing the blade back until the angle of the blade matches the angle of the block. You want to double check that this is referenced in here nice and square. And then you can just go ahead and tighten up this screw so this isn't going to move on you. And then you guys are going to love this next part because whenever you go to resharpen your block plane, from here out is all you have to do. All those steps that we just did before this, you only have to do those one time. What you're about to see is the actual sharpening process. So I'm going to go ahead and wet this down. Once again, I'm working on the coarse side right here. And then you want to put this nice and square on the stone. Hold your hands like this and we're just going to start working this back and forth. Now, this cheaper stone here isn't very long, and so you want to be extra careful that you don't accidentally go over the edge like that. But even worse, if you put too much pressure on the front and it catches the stone, it'll go ka-chunk like that, and that's going to kill your edge, and then you're going to have to regrind the bevel. So you do want to put a decent amount of pressure, but more importantly, you want to put even pressure and you just want to start working this. And I like to work it back and forth across the surface. That way the surface is staying nice and flat. And one way to tell that you've got this all the way down to sharp is you'll start to see little black lines of grit jumping off the front of this. And they should be nice and sharp, like line, line, line. So after I've worked this for about 30 seconds, I like to flip it over clean off the edge and check it. Be careful when you're wiping this. You don't want to cut yourself. Always wipe away from the blade. So you can see here on the back side, I've cut a little secondary bevel that's a little bit steeper than the main grind angle. The main grind angle was 25 degrees, and then I've got this little 30 degree micro bevel on the front of it. And the purpose of a micro bevel is it allows you to sharpen your planes a lot faster because you don't have to rehone this entire surface. So once you've got it looking like this, the next thing you want to check is to make sure that you've got a burr on the back side. Because if you've ground this down far enough, it'll actually cause the metal to curl over on the back side. And you can feel that by taking your pinky and just gently pulling it forward across that edge. And if you feel a little ridge right there, that lets you know that you've actually ground this down to the back side. And the next thing we're going to do is cut that burr off by holding the plane iron as flat as possible on top of the stone, just like when you were lapping the back side. And then at a little bit of an angle, you want to push this forward, just like that. A couple strokes, keep it nice and flat, and that's going to cut the burr off the back side. Okay, so now we can go ahead and flip the stone over. We're going to go to the 6,000 grit side. Once again, if you can afford it, it's really nice to have a 3,000 grit stone between the 1,000 and the 6,000. Tighten this up, spray it down, and then we're just going to do the same thing that we just did. Make sure you've got lots of pressure on it, but make sure you're pushing evenly. Try to work your way all around the stone, but try not to come off the front edge or the back edge. 
And that's really the nice thing about the larger, more professional stones, is they just give you more real estate to do this work. So as this front edge starts to get nice and sharp, you should see really crisp lines jumping off the front of this as you come forward. So at that point, you can flip it over again, check it, and it's a little tricky to feel the burr on 6,000 grit, but if you pull your finger across this, you can feel just a little bit of a burr. And just like before, we're gonna cut that burr off by holding the back side of the plain iron flush to the stone, make sure it's nice and flat, a little bit of an angle, and you're just gonna cut forward like this. I'm gonna to come to the other side so I have a little different angle. I'm gonna cut forward. And that's it. This blade is ready to go. Now, just a couple things to mention for putting the plane back together. The first one is that I like to tighten the tension on the cap to where I can still just barely move the blade back and forth with the adjustment screw. And so with this style, it's easy because you can just micro adjust it with this thumb wheel. But with this older lever cap style, it's basically you're going to adjust this screw right here and then you're gonna lock it down with the lever and then you're gonna to check to see if you can actually move the blade with the adjustment screw. And if it's a little bit too tight, you're gonna to need to slightly back off this screw. And if it's a little bit too rattly, you're gonna to wanna to tighten this screw. Now, the other thing you wanna check is to make sure that the blade is actually square in the throat right here. And if it's not, all you gotta do is grab it by the back here and just slide it a little bit to one side or the other and then check it, and you want this to be parallel to the edge of the throat. And now for the moment of truth. I've got a piece of Douglas fir scrap wood right here. This is way harder than the woods we normally build things out of. This is one and a half inches wide, so it's actually a little bit wider than the blade. And I'm just gonna start at one end. Now let's switch over to a piece of Eastern ash. And these are some pretty nice ribbons. This is the Douglas fir. And to be perfectly honest, both of these woods are harder than the woods we're normally working with. So just for fun here, I'm gonna set up a Greenland paddle that I'm working on right now. This is red cedar, which is pretty soft. And this particular paddle needs to lose a little bit of volume here and a little bit of volume here. And with a nice sharp block plane, you can just start mowing through this. And notice when I'm doing this in real life, I'm not actually pushing the block plane straight forward. If you run the block plane at a little bit of a skew, that's when you're gonna get those really pretty curls that come out the side of the plane. So that's the Jorgensen block plane. But just to show you guys why I still prefer the old Stanley 60 and a half, check this out. Both of those planes were dressed identical to each other. Neither of them is sharper or less sharp than the other. For some reason, the Stanley just seems to cut better. It's too bad they couldn't just keep making this exact same tool. All right, so that's my basic sharpening setup. I know this was a long video. Thanks for sticking with me. As you just saw, the initial setup process for a new block plane is kind of a pain in the butt, but if you take the time to go through all the steps and do it right, it's gonna reward you with a plane that's gonna cut beautifully, and the resharpening process is gonna be just a couple of minutes. Now, just a couple things I wanna mention here that I forgot. The first one is that when you get a brand new block plane blade, you wanna make sure there's no machine oil on it before you take it to your water stone, because if you get oil in your water stone, it's not gonna cut very well. And then one parting piece of advice is the more organized your sharpening gear and the easier it is to use, the more likely that you're actually gonna resharpen when you need it. So if possible, try to get a dedicated container for all your sharpening supplies and if you've got the space in your shop for it, nothing is better than having a dedicated little sharpening table because if all that stuff is already set up right there, 
When you notice your plane's getting dull, it's gonna be no big deal to pop the blade out, put a quick edge on it, and you're just gonna do much nicer work. So I think that's pretty much it for this video. As usual, if you like this video, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button. Also, if you wanna support the channel here, think about buying some tools off of our Amazon list, which is linked in the video description and also under the resources tab on our website. And also think about hitting that notification bell because we are getting ready to build two small sailboats back to back in the shop here and you don't wanna miss that content. And then finally, if you wanna learn more about what we do in general, make sure you check out our website, capefalconkayaks.com, where I have skin on frame building video courses, plan sets, and various free skin on frame resources. You can also find us on Instagram, at capefalconbuilds, where I post photos and videos of whatever we're working on in the shop or whatever we're testing out on the water. And you can find that same content on the Cape Falcon Kayak Facebook page as well. So that's it for now. Take care, be safe on the water, and have fun building your skin boat.